The manufacturer of today's loudspeaker is South Korea's Mon Acoustic, and it's called the Platimon VC1, quite a mouthful. And in this video, we're gonna see how this newcomer fares against a couple of more well-established high-end loudspeaker brands with two side-by-side -side comparisons. This episode is brought to you by the Bowers & Wilkins 800 Series Diamond Trade-Up Program. Click the link in the show notes for more information. Welcome back, everybody. Yes, these speakers are called the Platimon VC1. And in this video, I'm going to refer to them as either the Platimon or the VC1. So they're interchangeable, really. Now, these speakers, you can see them behind me, the metal ones, they're a two-way stand mount where VC stands for virtual coaxial. And that refers to the two five-inch mid-bass drivers that sit vertically astride an AMT tweeter. Now, what's an AMT tweeter, you might ask? Well, instead of a dome tweeter that pushes and pulls air backwards and forwards, an AMT is a long, flat membrane whose folds squeeze the air outwards, a bit like an accordion. Now, my previous exposure to AMT tweeters in speakers from Head and Golden Ear had me conclude that they sound dynamically exciting and they're resolving and they're actually masterfully, and I don't say this word lightly, masterfully smooth. And the Platimon is no exception in this regard. Now, in fitting that AMT driver, Monacoustic told me that they wanted to avoid any visible mounting screws on the front of the speaker. So they set the AMT behind the front baffle, which in turn necessitated a tapered letterbox waveguide across the tweeter in order to maximize horizontal dispersion. Now, because there's a lip on that waveguide, vertical dispersion is compromised a little bit. And when you stand up, you can hear the treble roll off a little bit. This is why it's crucial, crucial to set the AMT tweeter at ear height. Now, the cabinet on the VC1 is made from all aluminium. And that was apparently chosen by Monacoustics engineers because of its resonant behavior and because it's similar to that of the African Umpingu wood, which is now on an endangered list, which is why they can't use it. But to deal with the resonances that remain with the aluminum cabinet, Monacoustic put dampening materials inside each box, which is kind of normal for most loudspeaker designers. It's kind of like standard practice, right? You see it in every loudspeaker. But what they also did is they chose to have the, the speaker decoupled from the stand below with ball bearings. So that means that the VC1 effectively floats on top of the stand. And if we push it, we can watch it wobble. And those solid aluminum stands, they're not hollow, they're solid, they're very heavy, are included in the VC1's asking price. And we're talking here 6,500 US dollars with everything made in South Korea. in terms of first or initial listening impressions, the VC1's first arresting quality is its left, right channel separation. And when playing David Bowie's The Man Who Sold the World, I think everybody knows that track, right? We hear the sound of a percussion instrument, like a, a scraping sound, it's called a guiro, I had to Google it, and that is panned hard to the left, right? Really over on the left-hand side. And then cutting over to the Biosphere remix of Downloads, I think the song is called Atalal. I'm, I apologize if I've mispronounced that. We hear basically a cut-up vocal sample approach the back of the left speaker like an incoming train. It sort of pulls in from the front wall to that speaker. And then we get a drum groove sort of locked right down the middle, and then a keyboard melody line that sort of holds court just left of center, and then over on the right-hand side, we get some more subtler percussion. And I can call all of this out with confidence and ease, 
because the VC1 excel with sound staging and imaging and stereophony and the specifics of player placement. Like you know where everything is. Now let's be very clear. On transparency, the Platimon absolutely wiped the floor with the KEF R3 Meta. In fact, the only area in which the KEF keep up is on low end reach. And at over twice the R3 Meta's asking price, we would expect no less. However, this is not what many of you would call an apples to apples comparison. Price wise, it's apples to oranges. Now, I don't know where all this apples to apples and apples to orange business came from. And before I started mixing in hi-fi circles, the only person I ever heard say apples to apples or apples to oranges was my dad and he's 79 years old. Now I'd like to pause here to throw an album recommendation your way. And that is Alvanoto's Hybrid 2. Now you might know Alvanoto as an occasional Ryuichi Sakamoto collaborator, or you might know the Hybrid 1 album, or you might have heard it, and that came out in 2021. I think that was one of my favorite albums of that year. Now Hybrid 2 is still cemented in Alvanoto's world of abstract electronica, but this edition is more ambient than the first. It's much more ambient. In fact, most of it comprises very long, sort of droney ambient passages that are sort of only occasionally punctuated by bursts of static. And only on two tracks do we hear the introduction of a rhythmic structure. So as I say, this is a very sort of droney kind of record. But even those rhythmic structures are quite sparse sounding. So I recommend this album because, well not because it's so ambient, but just because it sounds so otherworldly and nothing like anything else really coming out at the moment. Maybe, maybe Wolfgang Voigt's Gas Project is the, probably the nearest touchstone to Hybrid 2. And also if you pick up the vinyl or the CD of Hybrid 2, its packaging is just top notch. Now for our first proper, proper side-by-side -side comparison today, we're gonna go with an apples versus oranges again. And quite literally, because the Kaya S12 from Vivid Audio, the orange speakers that you see behind me, they sell for 6,800 euros a pair. And the stands, I think they're an extra couple of grand, which is quite a bit extra, and that's obviously not for everyone. Now the Kaya S12, Go toe to toe with the Platimon on speed and excitement when delivering, I guess, the, the indie rock rush of Savage's husbands. And they are comparable-ish, I think, on spec sheet bass reach. But I'd say, just listening in room, that the Platimon go a smidge lower. Or maybe a better way to describe it is that the Platimon's low end has, I think, yeah, just more kick and more substance and more meat to it than the Vivid. But not a huge amount, we're talking just a little bit here. And we have to reach for some dub specialist to really hear that delta. Now the VC1 also reveals itself to be the meatier sounding of the two speakers with male vocals. And you should try Bob Dylan's Trying to Get to Heaven to hear what your speakers can do with male vocals and its meatiness. However, the VC1 can't quite match the Vivid on top end extension and mid range transparency, especially in the upper mid range where I think most of the sort of vocal clarity and vocal intelligibility, yeah, it generally sits there, right? In the upper mid range, lower treble. So if we play New Orders in a lonely place, the cymbals on that track, I think, shimmer with greater finesse on the Kaya S12 than the monoacoustic speakers. And to this end, I think that the Vivid pull a little more detail from the electromechanical innards of Monolake's crash. 
and that track is absolutely not for everybody. Now back with Bowie's The Man Who Sold The World on intraspeaker sound staging, so what goes on between each set of speakers, the two speaker models here I think are fairly evenly matched, but I think the Korean beats out the Brit or is it South African? I'm never quite sure on that, on left-right channel separation and also mid-range substance. Now many of you already know this, but it bears repeating I think for newcomers to this channel, in that I can only work with the gear that I have here and now. And that's why this next side-by-side -side comparison is also apples to oranges. And again, I'm talking about price. Like the Monacoustic, like the Vivid, the Wilson Audio TuneTot is also a two-way stand mount loudspeaker. One that comes from, I think, probably one of the most famous high-end loudspeaker manufacturers on the planet. I guess, yeah, we're really talking very high-end there. But it's also a speaker that sells for over twice the Monacoustic's asking price. And that's before we even add the optional stands that Wilson make for the Tune Tot. Now, before we get to listening differences, we should point out the one key difference between the Wilson and the Monacoustic is on nominal impedance. Because the Wilson are an eight ohm loudspeaker, which on paper at least makes them easier to drive than Monacoustic's four ohm load. So you need to make sure that your amp has a four ohm rating before considering the VC1. But a difference likely to be more noticeable to anyone listening side by side as I am and did is on bass reach. Because the Tuntar are only good down to the mid 60s hertz. They really, in my opinion, they need a subwoofer even in this six meter by five meter room. Whereas the Platimons, I'm kind of on the fence about that. Their mid 40s hertz bass mining means that with some cuts like Sonic Boom's Just Imagine, I'd like a sub in play. But on others like the flash bulbs, I think it's called Uphill Manual, possibly not. Now the Koreans also hit us with thrustier dynamics and better bass articulation than the Wilson. To leave the Wilson, I think, sounding comparatively, and I'm talking comparatively here, more polite when doling out the Veils' advice for young mothers-to-be, and that was an indie pop song released in the mid-noughties. But I would say that the Wilson are actually tonally more fulfilling when playing back Roger Waters' reworked version of Pink Floyd's Two Sons in the Sunset. Now, the Platimon, for me, play a little cooler than the Tune Tot, the Wilsons are what we call warmer and maybe just a tad richer. And it's the kind of warmth that keeps us listening for longer. And I think there's like a, a sort of a smoky softness, if that's not too pretentious, that I think late night jazz listeners would prefer when, yeah, when using the Wilsons. And I really think that that's what makes the Wilson so, yeah, so captivating to listen to. It's the, the more of a seductive quality rather than sort of an analytical quality. And that means that the Platimon, by comparison, cut the air with a sharper blade. Now that does not mean they are bright or overly incisive, not at all. It just means that when we put them side by side with the Wilson, we notice that the leading edges of strings and synthesizer transients cut through with a delicate but clean crispness and that the surface textures of instruments, I think, at the hands of the VC1 are more easily seen, if you know what I mean. You, you hear them, but you see them, right? Now, the Platimon VC1 also bests the Wilson on imaging and channel separation. I guess that's no surprises, really, given what we talked about earlier. But on soundstage depth, I think the Tune Tots take it. However, I tend to think that the Koreans pump a greater sense of majesty into Strauss's Also Sprach Zarathustra. Now, this side by side comparison has forced me really to reevaluate the Wilson's value proposition. Because from the Koreans, we get speakers and stands as well for half the Tune Tots asking price.
And those speakers in many, uh, yeah, in many respects, I think either better the Wilsons, and if they don't better them, they certainly draw up alongside the Wilsons in terms of audible performance and satisfaction. And at the very least, there's certainly no worse. So the monoacoustic Platamon VC1, I think is a solid example of how a newcomer speaker manufacturer can really compete with the big boys, compete with more well-established brands. Now I'm sure that there are many other loudspeaker models out there that I could run side by side with the, the Platimon VC1. But unfortunately, I don't have those loudspeakers here. But if you can live with that, please consider giving this video a like down below. And if you found this video entertaining or informative, please consider subscribing to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. Hello, me again, you're watching this video on YouTube, but if you're watching it over on Patreon, you'd get a slightly different cut. You wouldn't get any ads in the middle or at the beginning. You'd get bloopers at the end, and you'd also get a couple of days after the video going live, playlists for Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, and Kobos for all of the music mentioned in this video and all of the music featured in the video in the interludes. And this essentially will save you having to use Shazam when watching this video on YouTube. So if you'll consider supporting me over on Patreon, even if it's just for a month or something, just to buy me a cup of coffee, that would be tremendous. Thank you very much.